So I have uh, 7 p.m. and a quorum. Um, Kevin, should we <coughs> should we get started? Yep, we're ready to go. Okay, great. As a preliminary matter, this is Judy Vetter, Chair of the Finance Committee. Please permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Mark Adler. Okay. Yeah. Vikram Chabra. Present. Dennis O'Connell. Present. Aaron Howard. Present. Hannah Kane. Hannah Kane. Present. Jordan Rubin. Here. Carlos Garcia. Present. Mark Murray. Here. Great. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Kevin Mizikar. Present. Alexandra Martinez. Present. Good evening to you all. This open meeting of the Finance Committee is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the corona COVID-19 virus. The order allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely, so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. For this meeting, the Finance Committee is convening by Google Meet as posted on the town's website identifying how the public may join. Please be sure to press star six to mute your device. This meeting will not feature public comment. Please wait until I open the item for comment and press star six to unmute your device. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call. So at this time, I'm going to call to order the April 1st, 2021 meeting of the Finance Committee. We'll move on to accepting the immediate minutes of March 4th, 2021, and I'd like to group that with the March 11th, 2021, um, and open those up to see if there's any uh, corrections or changes. Does anyone have any corrections or changes to those minutes? Okay, then can I get a motion to accept both the March 4th and the March 11th meeting minutes? So moved. Second. Okay. Okay, great. It's been moved and seconded. So I'm going to now do a roll call vote to accept the, the, the two meeting minutes. Uh, Mark Adler? Aye. Vikram Charver? Uh, uh, aye. Dennis O'Connell? Aye. Aaron Howard? Aaron Howard? Hannah Kane? Yes. Jordan Rubin? Aye. Carlos Garcia? Aye. Mark Murray? Aye. Judy Vetter? Aye. So the March 4th, 2021 and the March 11th, 2021 meeting minutes are accepted as presented. We're now going to move on to item three, which was review and act on the proposition two and a half question on the May 4th, 2021 annual town election ballot. Uh, Mr. Mizikar, uh, I believe you have some information to share with the committee. I do, yes, and I, I'm going to share my screen uh, and provide with you a few slides with an overview um, and provide the committee formal information uh, on a Proposition 2 and a half override uh, ballot question that has been set by the Board of Selectmen for May 4th, 2021, which is the annual town election. Um, any voters that are watching should be aware that they're able to vote by mail-in ballot uh, without any reason for not voting in person, and they can reach out to the town clerk's office for doing that. Um, and there will also be early voting hours um, at the town hall that will be published. Uh, and then, of course, you can still vote in person as well on uh, May 4th. So um, I will share my screen and uh, go through a presentation. I did want to remind the committee that within your drive uh, for this evening, you will find two documents. Um, one is a um, commitment by the school committee and the board of selectmen to the public with regards to the parameters um, that are being set for this override, uh, with, uh, growth factors for expenses and uh, the total request and duration, which I'll get into, and then also an agreement between those two bodies uh, related to um, 
guess a little more functional detail surrounding the override. So look forward to answering any questions of the committee. Um, then I'll run through a couple slides. Uh, I have quite a few of them, but I plan to uh, move pretty briskly. So with regards to the override itself, I just want to take the opportunity to remind everyone where we were um, prior to, I guess, reconciling and balancing the budget. So basically the department had requests that came into me and uh, Superintendent Sawyer's request uh, in comparison to the available revenue showed a deficit of nearly $6 million. Um, we continue to see uh, modest growth in uh, taxation as it's constrained by Proposition 2.5 um, with uh, projected new growth of about $856,000 for this upcoming fiscal year. Uh, state aid with uh, general government unrestricted aid increasing by nearly three and a half percent and um, aid to uh, chapter 70 aid for educational purposes uh, at the minimum aid level of $30 per pupil uh, since the community exceeds its, um, exceeded the, the amount of state aid once uh, ed reform came into place uh, almost 10 years ago at this point. Um, Schedule A receipts um, are, a set of receipts that are really driven by economic activities and they have been significantly impacted by the pandemic. A free cash, one-time source of revenue that we do intend to use in the budget. Um, utility revenue uh, for indirect costs does benefit the general fund and is, comes in through ratepayer dollars and then traditional reduction of uh, the levy through various one-time revenue sources, mainly pilot payments from Selco. So when we look at uh, the challenges that are specifically facing the community um, that are really exacerbating a, a structural deficit that we have, um, I look at two main factors. The first being uh, COVID-19 and its impact on local receipts. Um, I'm seeing um, if we'd look back from fiscal year 2019, back five years, the trend uh, would put us on pace to anticipate about $14.7 million in local receipts for fiscal year 22. Unfortunately, I'm budgeting 10.9 and um, I don't see any opportunity to increase it even though we are on April 1st because the fiscal year 21 revenues are coming in just uh, at or slightly above budget. And when I say slightly above budget, I'm talking one or 2%. So still very narrow. Uh, motor vehicle excise receipts, which is our largest aspect of uh, local receipts, is about 60% of the total number. Uh, we've only collected 65% of what we budgeted for this fiscal year. So still some ways to go, even though we're 75% through the, the fiscal year. So, uh, and then of course, uh, due to changes in uh, requirements and um, actual aerial analysis of our unfunded liability for our pension system, um, we have to make payments greater than we originally anticipated we would. Um, and that's causing additional strain upon uh, the budget of about $1.8 million. So that puts us really in a net change of available funding for the general operating budget of almost $5.6 million. And you'll recall in the previous slide that we're near the $6 million in deficit for the fiscal year. So those two, these two things are really driving uh, the need to consider uh, a request for an override. So I talked about a structural deficit. It's something this committee is very familiar with, um, but it basically means that our long-term ongoing revenues um, do not keep pace with our recurring expenses. Um, and you can see with a simple uh, graph there on the right that you would have a surplus if your uh, recurring expenses exceeded your recurring revenue, which is certainly not the case for us, uh, balanced budget. Um, has recurring expenses and recurring revenues equal. And then a structural deficit is when your recurring expenses exceed your uh, recurring revenue. 
Um, and eventually it gets to a point where it's unsustainable and you can no longer take practical matters without uh, severely hampering operations. Um, and we need to make further consideration. Proposition two and a half provides uh, for the ability to ask the community for uh, more funding than two and a half percent in the tax levy year over year. So we're simply exercising the tool that's provided by proposition two and a half to request the taxpayers consider providing additional funding uh, for fiscal year 22 and beyond. We originally, which this was shared with this committee before, we had originally considered three models, uh, of three different funding levels in order to satisfy uh, a longer term um, a perspective on our expenses. So anything greater than three years. Um, we, the Board of Selectmen ultimately settled on um, a request uh, for nine and a half million dollars. Uh, they're projecting that or they're committing to not asking uh, another override question for four years at least. Um, and they've set the growth factors for the school budget at three and a quarter percent and the municipal budget for three and a half percent. So those caps uh, mean that the standard budget years, the schools, the, the, the schools will not exceed the four and a half cap. The municipal uh, budgets will not exceed, uh, excuse me, four and a quarter. Uh, the municipal budget will not exceed three and a half percent. We're also trending um, shared operating expenses at 6.15 percent. So that includes things like health insurance and general insurance. And or if you put those caps in place, the nine and a half million dollars, uh, I'll provide some details on this, but will last uh, for at least four years. And if a couple things would go right, perhaps longer, but the commitment is clearly for four years. So Where's the $9.5 million going to go in fiscal year 22? Uh, first and foremost, $5.1 million to the school department, $1 million uh, to municipal part departments. We're going to cut the use of free cash, which is a one-time revenue source that um, covers up for, but actually exacerbates a, a, a structural deficit. Um, but cutting it in half means we'll reduce it by uh, $300,000. And then we are going to establish an override, stabiliza override stabilization fund, which is really the key to a long-term year-over-year uh, -year sustainable model, given the constraints of Proposition 2.5 and, and $3.1 million of the override amount uh, would go into uh, that stabilization fund. So the override stabilization fund would require the passage of a Warren article to establish the special purpose override stabilization fund. Um, that would occur through a simple majority vote. Placing funding into the override stabilization fund would be a simple majority vote of town meeting. And then removing funds uh, from the override stabilization fund would require a two thirds vote of town meeting. Now, I'll talk a little bit about how the override stabilization fund will work over a certain time period. So it's a little busy on the screen right now. Um, these are all real numbers. Uh, revenues are forecasted based upon um, very uh, fine detail um, information that, that we've poured through over the last 90 or 120 days uh, to develop this model. And then um, the charges at the bottom of the screen for municipal and educational expenses uh, all broken out. Um, and debt service, obviously, uh, well, excuse me, debt services are actual schedule, but the municipal education and shared operating support are based upon the maximum trend growth factor um, that the Board of Selectmen and School Committee agreed to. So um, briefly, you'll see in fiscal year 22, in the yellow line that's on your screen near the top, the introduction of nine and a half million dollars in additional tax levy from the override. And at the bottom of the screen, uh, in the white lettering, you'll see $3.1 million that I previously talked about going into the override stabilization fund. Everything else is in, in the, the budget um, is balanced. Uh, and, and, you know, moving the three point, if you didn't move the $3.1 million, you, you would show a surplus in the year uh, of fiscal year 22. So moving forward into fiscal year 23, again, using the maximum uh, growth caps available just to prove that the model works. That doesn't necessarily mean that's where we're gonna budget to. Um, you'll see that another $1.6 million down there near the bottom uh, in white lettering would go into the stabilization override fund. And then starting in fiscal year 24, and then again in 25, 
you'll see in the line from override stabilization fund money starting to be pulled out of that fund and um, making itself available to preserve um, the duration of the override that's committed to. So um, unfortunately, if you're not using a, a tool like an override stabilization fund, um, you're not setting yourselves up for a, a longer term pattern. You'd have to continue to return to residents on a very short term basis in order to balance out uh, the budget. So um, you can see that as you move into fiscal year 26, you begin to show a deficit of $1.8 million. There still is funds being uh, drawn out of the override stabilization fund. So again, uh, we're using a, a somewhat conservative uh, revenue model and hitting the budget cap each and every year. Uh, so if our revenues come in a little bit higher and we're not up against the cap every year, then potentially um, you could see another year or so without having to ask this question. But again, the model proves out a four-year commitment and that's what has been made at this point. So just a little bit simpler terms, uh, uh, you know, closer in, so to speak, on the um, the details of this with the, the five-year, or excuse me, the four-year commitment and uh, how the municipal uh, and educational uh, budgets would work. Uh, over the four-year period, increasing from 137.8 to 149.9 uh, during that period. Again, assuming a uh, full growth factor is taken into uh, account. So whenever we consider uh, you know, a request like $9.5 million, it's obviously a, a very big number. It represents about 12% uh, of the total existing tax levy. Um, and the total existing tax levy, of course, provides uh, almost $86 million in revenue, including um, debt service. Um, that comes largely through the property tax. Uh, Shrewsbury, uh, well, that comes all through the property tax, largely through uh, a, a tax on uh, residential homes. 85 or 87% of Shrewsbury's property tax base comes from uh, residentials, uh, the residential sector. So um, there's obviously a lot of thought that has to go into this to, sh to understand the burden that would be placed on the taxpayers and individual finances. So uh, on the screen here, I have a comparison of uh, what we're using as our comparable communities. Uh, these communities are established on a numeric uh, based system that takes into account uh, total tax base, uh, total number of parcels, uh, total population um, and other demographic and financial factors and, and ties us to those communities. And then we've added three communities of Grafton, Northboro and West, uh, Westboro since they are our neighbors and um, easy to compare to uh, for most folks. So you'll see that Shrewsbury um, has a um, very modest uh, single family, average single family home tax bill of uh, about $6,455. Um, three communities that are less, uh, have less, actually have a much larger uh, tax base than us. Um, and at least two of them have a split tax rate, which skews this data a little bit. What I'm also showing on the screen is the percentage of per capita income, which is the red line uh, that is uh, paid into the property tax. And uh, this line graph uh, plays out that Shrewsbury has the lowest uh, average tax bill as a percentage of income. So it's just a little less than, uh, or just a little bit more than 12%. So what would it mean uh, for various property values? The average single family home value in Shrewsbury is $481,819. It would mean an increase of $704.34 for the year uh, for that a home valued at that. 59% of homes are valued at or below um, the average single family home value. And then uh, you can see the various other markers uh, that range at the you know, 25, 50, uh, 75, 95, uh, eight, excuse me, 80 and 95 percent uh, percentiles within the community. Uh, it would be uh, an increase on the tax rate of itself uh, as of right now with current total assessed values of $1.62. 
our tax rate is currently thirteen dollars and nineteen cents. So it would push it to fourteen eighty one. So talk a little bit about the budget models that are behind this, um, and kind of what would happen if the uh, override were to pass and what we'd have to do if it did not pass and what those implications may be. So we really have uh, three scenarios that quickly work through with you. The first one you've already seen in my fiscal projection one model. Uh, and then I do have the yes and no implications. The no implications uh, is the same, roughly the same total bottom line as uh, fiscal projection one, uh, but given the extreme burden that, that it would place on the uh, school operations, we found uh, modest ways uh, to shift some additional funding uh, over to the schools, which I will uh, talk to you about. So uh, this is fiscal projection one that I previously presented to you. It proposed um, spending $131,793,000. Um, and it had uh, a net reduction in municipal expenses of almost $200,000. The lion's share of discretionary funding going to the education budget um, and uh, the amount uh, that is being shown for the education line item is the town manager's recommendation, not what Dr. Sawyer had proposed. Uh, that's four hundred or $4.9 million greater than uh, my number. And then shared operating support again, which includes uh, general insurance, health insurance, unemployment, and the town's uh, FICA tax responsibilities as an employer, uh, an increase of $841,000. So debt service uh, is largely raised uh, um, through the exempted tax levy. Uh, it's increasing by $3.3 .3 million, uh, but one point Point one of that is actual revenue. They'll come in from Selco to pay for their fiber to the home uh, capital improvement project. So in all, $6.6 uh, $6 million in additional uh, funding year over year in the baseline model. So the baseline model, obviously, um, we requested that departments identify what they need to provide the level services to the community. So prior to since it's the town manager's uh, responsibility to produce a balanced budget 90 days before the annual town meeting uh, fiscal projection one i uh, eliminated nine hundred and sixty three thousand dollars in uh, spending proposals from uh, departmental budgets so on the municipal side uh, it, it continues to it would provide less than level services it's a continued bare bones approach because of the constraints of proposition two and a half. Again, uh, we would not be able to meet uh, resident service level expectations. Um, we continue to have very limited citizen support, uh, whether it's social workers um, um, that you know are being sought out for uh, for the police department. Um, or senior citizen outreach, which is a growing concern, especially in um, the, the pandemic times. Uh, we're not able to uh, meet service level expectations and provide funding um, that we'd like to for those type of services. And we certainly can maintain, but we're not able to kind of keep up with the increased demands on our parks facilities, our recreational opportunities, library materials and services are continuing to surge in demand even during the pandemic. Snow and ice operations, we continue to hear concerns about, you know, one of the main things that has come up over and over again this winter is, you know, why did you create those beautiful new sidewalks on Main Street if you're not going to maintain them in the winter, which we certainly don't have funding to do and expand that type of service. Uh, and I, I think there is a significant risk of losing the AAA bond rating. And we're certainly not dedicating any type of direct services to promote uh, and exploit economic development opportunities for the community. So the no vote um, on the override would obviously put us in um, a, a greater challenge situation because we know of the significant need within the school department. Um, we would further reduce municipal spending uh, by $374,000. Uh, we'd reduce shared operating support, which is kind of the discrepancy between the town manager's budget and in the school department budget where the town manager had some funding in there. 
uh, for increased FTEs for the opening of the Beale Elementary School, but I do not see any way to do that uh, without a yes vote on the override. So we're pushing those two changes over to the education department. $624,000 um, certainly isn't going to meet the $4.9 million gap. Um, and certainly consider all the options still moving forward, but uh, this is what we're calling fiscal projection too with a no overriding vote, um, more discussion to be had here. Um, you'll note that there is a change in debt service and this is just because we're given the opportunity to um, pay off all of our Title V debt, which is uh, related to uh, wastewater or, or septic systems at people's homes. So it's just a, a minor change we made between fiscal projection one and two. So fiscal projection two, significant reduction in the level of services, obviously still constrained by proposition two and a half, shifting uh, resources to slow the school hemorrhaging, but it's an insignificant beneficial impact. Um, we would have to reduce staffing levels on the municipal side. We fail to meet standard financial management requirements. I would propose to reduce the amount of funding that goes into other post-employment benefits through this model. Um, definitely cannot meet resident service level expectations. We would likely lose the AAA bond rating because of our inability to meet standard financial management requirements, uh, burdening our reserves more and contributing to other post-employment benefits uh, less. Um, Certainly will lose economic development opportunities um, that we are unable to exploit. And I feel that we'd really begin to disadvantage the town through non-competitiveness uh, across the board. Um, I have significant concerns, um, especially at the uh, department head level and the, you know, the, the senior management level on the town side. Um, our pay rates were very low in comparison to our competitors uh, historically. Uh, there's been uh, no additional uh, cost of living increases or uh, any type of wage changes in fiscal year 21, uh, despite many other communities, even our region doing that. And then if we have to sustain another year with no raises um, and no growth, uh, I'm really concerned about uh, our ability to, to attract and retain talent. Uh, we also have some significant um, Financial management position changes on the horizon. Um, recently, uh, Principal Assessor Chris Reedy announced his retirement at the end of April. Um, I'm concerned that uh, the salary level that we have there for that position and being able to recruit and retain or attract talent in for that position. And then we know within, um, you know, roughly the next two fiscal years, town accountant Mary Thompson uh, will be retiring. And uh, that would be a big stress point and factor um, with the amount of uh, salary that, that we're currently offering her, whether we can actually bring in a qualified candidate to replace her. So this is, that would definitely strain it. Um, continuing on with uh, the override model, it's kind of a breath of fresh air and a new opportunity to look at a, a sustainable funding model for the town, uh, provide some um, opportunities for us to um, not have to deal with uh, uncertainty over the next four years and really plan and, and strategize uh, with the community on uh, what our priorities are and how we can continue to move the town forward. I've talked about how the override dollars are going to be spent and then some of the funding going into the override stabilization fund. So kind of from a narrative basis, how do I see this? Um, it's still a level services budget, but we would be meeting those department head expectations. Um, it would enable um, some additional hires and um, funding support for parks and recreation services and things like that that I can touch upon. One of the biggest things that I would look forward to in this is the opportunity to engage with the community to develop a strategic plan um, where the community would be able to uh, help direct us and prioritize this funding and, and um, really help set the direction on how we move forward. We certainly would be able to begin meeting uh, service level expectations. We would propose uh, a senior level social worker within the police department. Um, we would expand the senior outreach um, coordinators position hours to a full-time position. 
Uh, we'd be able to fully maintain parks facilities. We would be adding an FTD to do that. Um, I'm confident that we'd be able to maintain our tri uh, AAA bond rating under this um, scenario and really start to enhance a couple other things that we haven't just placed priorities on, again, in, consult in consultation with the community. But proactive economic development and business recruitment, begin to dedicate staff to do that, um, begin to um, stabilize and potentially build uh, library material levels and services, um, provide for additional recreational opportunities, programs and facilities, and maybe begin to even walk away from the, the sole model that we have, which is pay as you go and just provide general amenities to the community, um, put a little bit more resources into snow and ice operations, um, and, and uh, look at additional opportunities for mobility initiatives, including sidewalks. We know it's, a, it's something that we hear from the residents uh, frequently throughout the year, not only the sidewalks we have in, in failing conditions, but there's a lot of area uh, even adjacent to parks where we don't have any sidewalks at all and it's unsafe. So Madam Chair, I would like to continue and, and walk through the provisions of the American Rescue Plan uh, and its potential impact on town operations, but I know I've been talking for about 25 minutes at this point. This is kind of how three budget scenarios would play themselves out and the override model um, in consideration or in consideration of the override model. So uh, I would pause there and, and see how you'd like for me to proceed. All right, at this point, I think, uh, thank you. This is a lot of information. So what I'm gonna do is go down through um, the, uh, and, and take a roll to see if there's any questions or comments, and then, um, then we'll pr proceed with your presentation. Um, so uh, I'm gonna begin with Mark Adler. Any questions or comments? No, thank you. Uh, Vikram Charber, any questions or comments? No, I'm all set, thank you. Dennis O'Connell, any questions, comments? I did, I did have one quick question. Um, if the override passes, we're still putting a, some of a cap on what the school department could get for a year in municipal departments. They can't, you know, they're agreeing to, you know, pull on the reins, whatever we want to say, and try to keep the services where they are, and they're not looking to, this is not going to expand services. Um over the four year period has the ability to expand services. Um, but fiscal year 22 would be a level services budget. Um, okay. the, the school has identified the ability to begin to restore some of the service cuts that it uh, had to make in the past. Um, and we certainly would be able to uh, build on some things on the town side. Um, there are certain provisions if uh, dividing up ongoing uh, so if we identify additional ongoing revenues in the out year that are not in the model um, or above and beyond the model um, that those caps you know we could go slightly above those caps um, by an additional quarter percent um, but that would provide a little bit of enhanced services but uh, yeah fiscal year 22 is just a level services budget okay so there is provisions also if there's a big uptake to the budget that they wouldn't spend all that budget that could would that some of that be moved into the um fund yeah so the yeah so that's true so if if you know there's a given year where we don't have to go to the cap um that excess revenue would be placed into the stabilization fund which benefits us in future years and potentially extends great. the the duration of the override great Thank you. Aaron Howard, any questions or comments? No questions, thanks. Hannah King? Hannah, do you have any questions or comments? No? Okay. Uh, Jordan Rubin, any questions or comments? Uh, nope, all set, thank you. Uh, Carlos Garcia, any questions or comments? Uh, no question. Just um, just want to thank Mr. Mizakar for this clear presentation of what's potentially at stake and what we could um, gain through this vote. So thank you. 
excuse me, Judy. I'm sorry. I'm back now. My microphone. Okay. Working. Okay. I did. Um, I did have one question just to ask the town manager to expand upon it. Um, you know, the AAA bond rating. If you could just, uh, I think, articulate how much of an impact that has in terms of what we pay our cost of borrowing and the implications for losing more available funds if that was to change. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah. So uh, the 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 biggest difference that I can illustrate is you know when we change from uh, our prior AA plus bond rating to the AAA. Um, whenever we are going into, uh, and that was during the Beal borrowing process. So we had projected, uh, you know, principal and interest for that project that was about a $58 million borrowing. Um, and we are using our old bond rating because, you know, that was the most prudent thing to do to illustrate the cost to the, to the residents. And ultimately with the AAA, we saved over $4 million in total interest over the 20 year life of, of the Beal borrowing. Um, and then we maintain that AAA bond rating and receive the um, amazing interest rate of 1.41% for the police station project. Um, that is one of the lowest interest rates that we've, we have ever uh, received on a borrowing. Um, it, it's, it's almost, you know, like free money, um, you know, interest rate that low on such a large project provides significant savings, millions of dollars over the life of it. And the AAA bond rating really is like a, a, a personal credit score and it, it's, it drives the interest rate and the uh, attraction to buying our bonds in the competitive marketplace. And those two projects alone, I'm, I'm confident that, that we've saved um, at least six million dollars uh, in comparison to our prior bond rating. Thank you. I just think it's important that people see that you know that what they're paying in, in taxes you know has a clear consequence to what our bond rating is um, relative to the overall uh, cost of a project that we have to pay for as residents. Thank you, uh, Mark Murray. Any questions or comments? I'm good, Judy. Thank you. So uh, I guess I had a question or, or more like you talked about if the override does not pass and obviously we would have to do for um, further cuts to the municipal budget in order to be able to, I believe it's the 624,000 um, that you'd be able to add to the school budget. Um, however, that would still result in significant cuts on the school side. Um, I mean, that certainly goes, that's, I mean, it's good that you, I mean, it's robbing Peter to pay Paul, but at the same time, um, we would still see significant cuts on the school side. Is that correct? Oh, it's absolutely correct. I, I, the other night at the board of Secretary meeting, I called it a token. I mean, that's really all it is. I mean, you know, the school budget, um, is, um, you know, over $5 million or roughly $5 million in deficit or, you know, in compared to the town manager's budget. Uh, so $600,000, um, you know, is, is, is nothing. Uh, it's not going to, it's certainly not going to close that gap. So I believe that, so obviously that would still result in um, loss of teaching positions, teachers and, and, and different cuts to the school. But I believe I heard you say that that, that would mean that we would not be able to open Beal. Did, did I hear that correct? That is correct. Yeah, there's, yeah, the, under that model, there's no way to open Beal. Um, you know, the cost of opening Beal is $1.6 million. So even in that alone, we're still a million dollars off from being able to fully staff it and open it. Um, so it's, I, it's really shared pain. <laughs> so I guess I have a, have a concern if there's uh, maybe an additional liability that we have, because obviously we've got money from the state um, based on an agreement that we would build and open Beal. Um, and we got millions of dollars um, from the state. So if we're not able to uphold our contractual end, what does that what does that mean? Do we have to pay back? Will, will we have to pay the state back? What do we have a potential large bill um, if we don't proceed based on? I mean, they gave us money under good under an understanding, and then all of a sudden we're, we may not be able to do that. Are we looking at the, at another shoe dropping here? Um, 
yes, that's a it's a very strong likelihood. We reached out to the MSBA and, and let them know of our financial challenges, and they sent uh, me a letter back that said, you know, if the building isn't used for a school, then we would have to return the funding. So the funding um, from the MSBA grant for, or which is a grant for that school is $33 million. Um, so, you know, we have a project funding agreement with them that is in place. Uh, and they made it very clear that if the building is not used as a school, that um, we would have to repay those funds. So I, I'm, I'm not saying that the $33 million bill comes due you know, on July 1st or something like that, but they've made it very clear that the project funding agreement is a legal agreement between the town and the MSBA, um, and there'll be consequences if we don't move forward. So I think maybe if we have, you break it down then, um, if the override doesn't pass, um, we're definitely going to see a, a decrease in our school programs. We're gonna see a decrease in our municipal um, services. Most likely we'll see a drop in our bond rating, which will cost the town more if we have to borrow money. Um, so that's going to be an issue. Um, and now if we potentially um, are holding the bag for, for this amount, uh, if you start adding that up, the taxpayers could actually save money by voting yes on this override in the long run it could actually save save the taxpayer money by voting for this override as opposed to not voting for it that is what is what i'm hearing is that a fair assessment yeah it it would be yeah i mean there's certainly you know longer term cost implications above and beyond staffing cuts and things like that service level cuts that we would face in the future uh, if we're unable to open the school and do lose our AAA bond rating. All right. Well, nobody wants to pay more in taxes, but I think if you, you break it down, um, you know, in a, as a math equation, you know, it's like pay me now or pay me more later. It might be better to, I think it's going to be in everybody's best interest to, to do this now. At least that's the way I look at things. Um, so any other questions or comments on the material that Mr. Mizakar has prepared? Judy, I have a question. Um, I was thinking, uh, on Kevin, on your last slide, um, you know, you talk about begin enhancements and um, you talk about the proactive economic development and business recruitment. And my question, I, I think that's the answer to my question, but I just wanted you to help maybe expound, expound upon that a little bit. Um, you know, we, we, we do this override, it's for a set amount of time, and it's a wonderful model. It's proven to be very effective in other communities. And, you know, um, I'm very pleased that both the uh, Board of Selectmen and the school committee are on the same page and it, it's wonderful. But four years from now or five years from now, um, how, do we pre how do we prevent ourselves from being in the same place? I mean, what do, what do we have to do as a community to, you know, lessen the, the chance of overrides? Uh, and, you know, not that an override is a bad thing, because it's not, but um, it just seems that, you know, we, we would want to find ways to not have to do it. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. And, and keying in on proactive economic development and business recruitment is, is really, the, you know, the major or the sole way that we can do it. We're, we're heavily reliant upon the property tax um, that's obviously ultimately in the long run and, and in local government finance 101, you always want to control your own destiny. This is how we control our own destiny through uh, the property tax um, and building more commercial development, um, finding smart ways to build out the Route 20 corridor and, mm -hmm. and improve the value of that land is certainly a key to extending the duration of this override. Um, we need to uh, be more aggressive and, and be more planful and be more smart uh, of, of, of how we take on uh, development. And um, certainly the commercial sector um, has higher values, uh, you know, normally per acre, and they also uh, demand less uh, non-paid services. So they certainly use utilities, but, you know, obviously the, the challenges don't come from, you know, additional kids in the schools and 
uh, you know, snow and ice operations from subdivisions and things like that. So really economic development is, is a, is a tool to extend the, the uh, duration of any override and, and build the financial sustainability in the community. Right. And it's, and we do have the inventory, right? It's not like, uh, you know, this is a pie in the sky thing. We, we have the ability to do this in terms of yeah. the inventory. Yeah. I mean, Route 20 is a, is a corridor that we're looking at from so many different levels, whether it's the master plan that Rep Kane has worked with Mass DOT on or, the sewer investments of you know five point six million dollars that we've made in that corridor or making in that corridor, um, and, and just unlocking it. So that that land is there, and it, it's a it's a commercial industrial corridor already. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on the material that Mr. Mizikar has presented um, so far? Just wave a hand. Okay, seeing none, Mr. Mizikar, um, if you would. Be so kind as to continue with your presentation. Thank you. Yep. So I do want to talk uh, a few minutes about the American Rescue Plan, which is the, the large federal stimulus package, the $1.9 million that uh, passed and was signed by the president on March 11th. Um, so I apologize for the date, but this is kind of a snapshot in time with what we uh, know and when we knew it. So um, and unfortunately, we don't have any updates, so I kind of just left the slides as they are. So we know that the American Rescue Plan, although it's um, a, a significant sum of funds that will be coming into the community, it's not a long-term solution because it's not a, a continuing or ongoing revenue source. So it's not going to solve any of the financial challenges that we've previously talked about this, this evening. In fact, uh, in my opinion and uh, others, using... Uh, funds from this stimulus package to um, fill as a stopgap measure um, uh, the hole that we have in our budget would actually create a, a bigger hole in the future. So um, this is a quote that um, I'm showing from the Massachusetts Taxpayers Foundation I just underlined the middle sentence there that says, you know, however, these sources are, are, are temporary. Um, so it's not a long-term solution. We know we have a structural deficit, which is an ongoing problem, not a one-time problem. So, um, you know, the preliminary information that has come out to the town, you know, th through even today, but, you know, came out at, at the end of uh, March is that um, we just don't know a lot at this point. Um, we don't really understand, oh, excuse me, I must have skipped the, skipped the slide here. Um, I feel like I'm missing a slide, but um, so we know that funding can go out really in uh, four different categories to the town. Um, it can go out uh, for a direct pandemic response. It can go for water, sewer, and broadband projects. Um, they're providing some allowance to uh, additional wages to frontline uh, and first responders. Um, and then for some revenue replacement. Um, and that revenue replacement um, is really still be determined how you make those calculations. So there's many more unknowns than knowns. Um, the timing of the detailed guidance in the U.S. Treasury, from the U.S. Treasury and the Massachusetts Department of Revenue is likely to come um, sometime in early May. Um, we, we know that... Um, We've seen estimates from organizations like the Massachusetts Municipal Association, and other groups, or we, we don't have an official document um, from the Department of Revenue telling us exactly how much money we're going to receive. Um, we know that we'll receive funding distribution 50-50 uh, uh, in uh, two different waves, but we're not exactly sure when the funding will be released. Uh, we're hopeful that it's, uh, we understand that it'll be in within fiscal year 21. Um, excuse me, uh, calendar year 21 and calendar year 22. But again, we don't have uh, that detailed requirements. And there certainly always comes along with packages like this, um, matching requirements, other strings, um, and, and how the funds exactly can be used. And we're just uncertain on this. We can't really use any information that we have at this time to really plan for how we're going to use the funds. So what we know is estimated this at this point is that the federal legislation uh, should get us the funding sometime by early June. Uh, and that's likely to, to be the first round. 
Um, according against the Massachusetts Municipal Association, the town stands to receive about $11.2 million. Um, that comes from two different funding formulas. 3.8 is a direct municipal aid estimate. And then since Worcester County uh, is not a functioning government entity, uh, there's a per capita uh, apportionment of $194 per resident that uh, would come directly to the town for uh, those four categories, which I previously outlined. Um, we're unsure at this point in time whether the funds would be forwarded to us uh, in advance or we'd have to request them through reimbursement like we have to do for the CARES Act. Uh, and again, we, we have significant questions um, of what the matching requirements or other strings would be. Um, so with those um, eligible areas uh, that we could spend the funding on, uh, pandemic, uh, direct pandemic responses. I can tell you that, you know, over the course of the last 13 months, um, we have spent uh, $4.8 million on direct pandemic costs. Certainly some of those are only one-time costs that we wouldn't have to occur again in the future to enable remote or working environments by plexiglass uh, shields to retrofit our offices and make them safer, things like that. But um, responding to the pandemic is certainly uh, an ongoing and costly challenge in, in order to uh, keep operations even uh, in the altered state that we've been experienced during that time period. Um, certainly, uh, the eligibility to provide premium pay to essential workers. Uh, we don't know what any matching requirements on that would be or other strings uh, involved, but there always has been in the past. And then the same thing for those water, sewer, and broadband, broadband projects. So again, bringing up that Massachusetts Taxpayers Foundation quote, it says their use will be re will require a thoughtful and deliberate approach in order to promote the strongest recovery for all residents that can be sustained after ARP is gone. So that's our biggest challenge is, uh, yes, $11.2 million is, is a, a sizable amount of money, However, it's a one-time use of funds and certainly uh, will be uh, utilized very quickly. One illustration of that is the $4.8 million that we spent over the last year. And then even if we're considering uh, what we may want to uh, think about under um, the water and sewer broadband projects, um, we certainly have a plethora of projects that we know we need to undertake and actually uh, we've just considered a sewer rate increase to uh, take on those top two projects. Uh, but just shown on the screen here, $17.5 million for the capital projects that are in the pipeline for us. So even if we were just to dedicate uh, the funds uh, for these purposes, uh, we certainly don't even have enough money to do that. So um, just... One more thought about uh, the eligible uses. Um, when we can undertake revenue replacement, we're just certainly not, we're not sure yet um, how exactly we make those calculations. We know we have to look back to fiscal year 2019 because that was the year prior to the pandemic. Uh, we're not sure if we have to look category by category or total variance. Uh, would there be other uh, parameters that were put in place? Um, and the only reason I do have to say that I can sit here and even provide you with this level of information is because of the uh, work that Representative Kane did and uh, talking to the folks that she uh, is able to talk to at the various state agencies to try to get uh, as much information as possible and certainly have to thank also uh, John Nijelski from uh, Governor um, excuse me, Congressman McGovern's office, who's his district director, uh, who provided me with some of this information. So, but uh, with a quote that came in uh, from uh, Rep Kane, from someone that she spoke with, um, they're strongly advising against making any financial decisions with the information that we have at this point. It's just certainly not advisable. So um, there's, you know, if we think about the, the, the revenue replacement again, there's, there's such a wide varying opportunity that we may be under, able to undertake, um, but it certainly would be welcome. And the Board of Selectmen is committed to, and certainly I'm committed to using this as, as wisely as possible um, to prolong the duration of the, the override, to forego asking for the full amount um, until it's absolutely needed. So providing that uh, benefit the taxpayer, but we don't want to make any big promises until we have full guides and details to see 
exactly how we can use it for. So how will things play out? Um, again, not a long-term financial solution. Uh, if we think about the timeline that lays out before us, you know, we're certainly going to have to ask the ballot question uh, before we uh, are likely to have any information. Um, information um, may be coming out to us um, just prior to town meeting with that initial round of guidance. We know that uh, full guidance and funding should be released to us in early June. Um, but I think the good news is, is that um, we have a November 30th, 2021 deadline to set the tax rate and we have ultimate flexibility on what revenue model we pick and utilize for fiscal year 22 the whole way up to that point so if there is any opportunity to um, use uh, revenues to off or use funding to offset revenues um, we have you know the whole way up into november to do that so certainly time is our ally um, the amount of certainty will continue to increase, and it should come to fruition um, in time for us to make the decision uh, with the best interest of the taxpayers in mind. So that uh, concludes everything that I wanted to touch upon, Madam Chair, and happy to turn the meeting back over to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mizikart. Um I'm going to go down through uh, the roster and see if there's any questions or comments. Uh, Mark Adler? No, thank you. Vikram Chabra? I'm all set, thank you. Dennis O'Connell? I'm all set, thank you. Aaron Howard? No questions, thanks. Um, Heather Kane? Uh, thanks, Judy. I would just add that um, I think that the way in which the town manager is approaching the potential for some of the federal dollars coming into the community is absolutely the right way uh, because what we don't want to do is, is mask the problem for another year and then have an even greater financial cliff that we have to climb um, next year or the year after. So I think again, with the commitment that, you know, any dollars that will be coming in from the federal government um, will offset as much as possible what we have to do, but with the knowledge that um, the way that the town manager is looking at using the dollars available to us uh, through all the four different ways in which we have it, particularly around some of the investments in our sewer. Again, you know, one of the things that challenges us from time to time is that, you know, from an economic development perspective, we need to be ready for economic development, which means we need to have sewer capacity. And so those investments that are going to be made using those funds um, help us significantly in the future um, to be able to be attractive for the development that we need, particularly on Route 20. So I, I just want to support um, the way that the town manager is looking at, at the opportunity to use these funds. Well, well said. Um, Jordan Rubin, any questions or comments? All set. All set. Thank you. All right. Carlos Garcia? No questions. Thank you. Okay. Mark Murray? No questions, Judy. Okay. And um, I don't have any questions either. I agree with what uh, the comments that Hannah made. Um, so at this point, uh, Hannah, can I um, ask you to make a motion, please? Yes, I would move that the Finance Committee vote to approve the Override Stabilization Fund Model Framework as presented by the Town Manager tonight and as agreed to by the Board of Selectmen and the School Committee and to support the $9.5 million operational override question uh, that will be placed before the voters on the May 4th ballot. Second. Okay. The motion has been made and seconded, so we're going to take a roll call vote. Mark Adler? Aye. Dick from Traber? Aye. Dennis O'Connell? Aye. Aaron Howard? Aye. Hannah Kane? Aye. Jordan Rubin? Aye. Carlos Garcia? Aye. Mark Murray? Aye. Judy Vetter, aye. So it, we, the Finance Committee unanimously um, approves the motion to support um, the Proposition 2.5 override question and um, and the way that Hannah phrased it, uh, the rest of what she, she said. So um, great. Are there any other questions or comments on that subject? All right. 
Judy, could I just, I, I'd like to just thank the town manager uh, for all of his work um, over the last couple of months. I think that this has uh, been incredibly well thought out um, and all the diligence that has been done to ensure that uh, the way that we approach this has the respect of the taxpayers, meaning that we will do everything possible to limit uh, what we need, but we also uh, in good faith need to ensure that we're asking for what may be necessary in order to continue to provide the level of services that our town uh, residents have uh, come to expect and value. Thank you. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I mean, the, the, the amount of planning and thought that's gone to this approach is, is really terrific. So I agree with that. All right, at this point, then we'll move on to item number four, which is review of the fiscal 2022 budget hearings. Mr. Yep. Mr. Clark? Yeah, Madam Chair, as you, as you know, the committee is well aware, we begin um, finally, I guess, uh, budget hearings uh, for fiscal year 22 starting next Thursday. April 8th and continuing into uh, Saturday the 10th. Uh, we've laid out a preliminary schedule. Um, I think there's some opportunity to um, modify that somewhat. We had an original three hour block with the school committee. Um, and, you know, they certainly have been in and provided a thorough presentation of uh, really their all aspects of their uh, model, whether it's with the override or not. So we may look to tighten that up a little bit, but um, I will be providing to the committee um, the line item detail for uh, those uh, three budget models, fiscal projection one, two, and three that we've talked about. And we'll uh, be as clear as we can uh, about uh, how we um, are proceeding and, and what figures we're talking about as we go through the, the various departments with you. Um, I think this year is also going to be a little bit of a challenge as we go through the budget hearing process to kind of keep that straight and then to decide um, how the finance committee will write um, their narrative for the town meeting book. And we certainly stand ready to provide any support and assistance that we can in writing that. Um, but we are really scheduling things so that the town meeting books will be green lighted um, based upon the result of the override the following day. So there's going to have to be some uncertainty um, on um, what we do before May um, 4th and then after May 4th. So their town meeting certainly is May 22nd. Um, and so the committee can reconvene before that and provide, you know, vote on anything else uh, to guide town meeting once you get there. But, you know, we'll be talking about all three sets of numbers and have to come to some types of conclusion on how you want your, to write your report so we can press go on it the day after the override. Okay. All right. So just by a show of hands, any questions or comments um, on this schedule? Okay. All right. Great. So those will be a, a couple fun filled days there. Um, so I'm going to move on to the correspondence. Then uh, we have two, uh, actually two different emails um, from Stan Toronzi, uh, 562 South Street regarding the two and a half override. One was on March 23rd and then a follow up on March 29th. So at this point, uh, can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. It's Second. been moved. Second. Seconded. So all in favor of adjourning the meeting? Uh, Mark Adler? Aye. Vicky Charber? Aye. Dennis O'Connell? Aye. Aaron Howard? Aye. Hannah Kane? Aye. Jordan Rubin? Aye. Carlos Garcia? Aye. Mark Murray? Aye. Judy Vetter? Aye. So this evening's meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for your for your time and have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.